Hello, I'm Karen Pascal. I'm the director of the Henry Nouwen Society. Welcome to a new episode of Henry Nouwen, Now and Then. Our goal with these podcasts is to allow the wisdom, honesty, and encouragement found in the life and work of Henry Nouwen to speak to a world hungry for meaning. We invite you to share these podcasts with your friends and family. Because we're new to the world of podcasts, taking time to give us a review or a thumbs up will mean a great deal to us and will help us reach more people. Now let me take a moment to introduce today's guest. Marjorie Thompson is an ordained Presbyterian minister. She has over 30 years experience in retreat work, teaching, and writing on spiritual formation. Author of the best-selling book, Soul Feast, An Invitation to the Spiritual Life, Marjorie considers writing central to her calling. We were so fortunate that Marjorie accepted our invitation to write the first book in our Henry Nouwen Caregiving series. Drawing from her decade of experience as a caregiver, firsthand for aging parents and then for her own husband, Marjorie wrote Courage for Caregivers, Sustenance for the Journey in the Company of Henry J.M. Nowen. Marjorie, when you penned this book, we did not see a pandemic on the horizon, but here we are and we have something so valuable to share with our audiences. As you wrote Courage for Caregivers, what did you discover about Henry's distinctive, maybe even unique perspectives on caregiving? Henry brought forward some really distinctive perspectives on care that um, were just characteristic of his way of seeing reality um, in a, it, through a spiritual frame. And I don't know, you know, if if all these things that I consider distinctive to Henry were were entirely unique to him, because I think, like all of us, Henry built on the insights of others, but. Uh, but at the same time, I don't know any writer before Henry, you know, who, for example, distinguished between care and cure. Um, there might have been, but but I'm not aware of them, and I don't think most other folks are. Henry's maybe maybe his most unique contribution. Um, I think is to highlight certain spiritual truths over and over in different ways through his many writings over time. Um, my husband John, who you know, as you know, worked with Henry for five years at Yale and really knew him quite well, um, used to say that Henry's insights were like these little gems, and uh, in different, in different of his books, Henry would often take. <clears throat> one of his basic ideas and and lift up that gem and uh, just kind of turn it this way and that way, um, help us to see it through a new lens in this book and then in another way in, in another book so that um, we get to see the many facets of that gem in relation to various parts of our own lives. I think that's that was really part of Henry's genius, um, but but just uh, to come to the sort of distinctive things, I think you know as I was writing this book on caregiving, I think Henry's understanding of the meaning of care itself just really came alive for me in fresh ways. Um, for him to point out that the Greek word for care is kara, which really means to lament, to mourn, to, to share in another person's pain. Um, that is so foundational to Henry's perspective on caring, that it's not so much taking away another person's suffering as entering into it, feeling their weakness, powerlessness, their pain, you know, feeling that with them. And that same understanding informs Henry's teaching on compassion. So moving from the Greek to the Latin, the Latin compassio literally means to suffer with. So out of these two ancient language roots, um, we get a picture that all forms of care are essentially expressions of compassion. And I guess um, in in my own experience, 
um, my own experience of caregiving really revealed how true this is. If we can't feel the suffering of those we care for, then it's a kind of limited and external expression of care. Uh, and I mean, I experience this. There are days when we can feel compassion and days when we can't. And it's really not helpful for us to expect constant compassion of ourselves when, when we're under great stress uh, in caregiving day after day. I, you know, I think we can acknowledge that only God's compassion is perfectly consistent. That's really but, that that that's, that is very insightful, actually. You know, it's I, I feel in that um, almost a relief because you you're right. There's times that you go, I'm I'm just so cold. I'm so cold hearted in this. You know, instead of because it's just it's just actions. But it's an interesting thing. I love the way Henry constantly kind of goes back to the root of some of these words. That's his nature. He'll take you back into the Latin or the Greek or whatever because he founds, finds a depth of meaning in them and then unwraps it for us. And I think that's very helpful. Can I ask you, you mentioned care versus cure, that he drew that distinction. What exactly do you mean by that? Well, I think, you know, what Henry meant by it was that our whole culture is so focused on cure. We're, we're just, we're a culture of fixers. <laughs> we really want to, uh, we want to fix the problem. Um, <clears throat> and, and that's just kind of endemic to, to our Western cultural norms. So, you know, in the medical profession, the whole purpose of medical care is to cure people. And, I think Henry understood really clearly that um, that's, there's a kind of trap in that. And, of course, you know, if we can, we would like to be able to cure people. We'd like to be able to relieve pain and suffering. We all want that um, for ourselves and for others. But there are so many situations where we really can't. Um, we can't cure and we can't take away the suffering. We may be able to alleviate it, but we can't really take it away. And oftentimes in our caregiving of others, you know, I'm, I'm thinking here of home caregiving situations, which is what I'm most familiar with. Um, in, in my case, I was caring for, for my mother and my mother-in-law at, at the end stages of their lives. And there was no cure. Um, it was just the natural progression of things. So uh, this this might be true for a parent who's taking care of a medically fag- fragile child at home. Um, there's no cure, but but as Henry put it, care is always possible, even when cure is not. And to be able to move out of that. Um, mentality where we we think it's our responsibility to to take away another person's suffering. If we can't do that, it becomes very frustrating. It becomes um, a, a psychological burden to us to imagine that we need to try to do that. So I think part of the beauty of what Henry does in making this distinction is to free us up from the idea that that we that we always need to cure <clears throat> that that even needs to be the goal and that care um care can be a constant and and give us a kind of compass if you will a direction so we can always uh, grow in our capacity to care for another and i think um you know, when I said only God's compassion is perfectly consistent, it's, we ours is not. And, you know, we just, we get weary, of course. Uh, but I think we can, over time, grow into a more mature, compassionate care. And, and it really helps to see that it's not up to us to take our care receivers pain away when we can't do that. We're We're only asked to do what we can. And sometimes the best we can offer is to just be present with another with love and openness to whatever they're experiencing 
um, whatever they may need to talk about or um, just with with understanding. It's interesting how given the uh, giving the, the reality of the pandemic, we are hearing a great deal about caregivers and we're seeing people really pressed to the limit on the front line of caring for people with the COVID virus and and uh, exhaustion and the vulnerability they are facing with uh, the fact that they themselves can become sick. It's it's really uh, it it it's turned the focus towards caregivers in in a in a fresh way, and we really see them as heroes. But some of the heroics are almost in a sense lost on those people that disappear into home caregiving situations, sometimes just overnight. Uh, your spouse has a stroke, your um, uh, you're dealing with a, an aging parent who has dementia, all sorts of different kinds of things can transform a person's life overnight. And suddenly they no longer have a sense of the freedom of their life. They are, they have a purpose and it is, and a responsibility to care for somebody. And those people right now are continuing that job and, and probably continuing it with a great sense of the vulnerability of the person they're caring for because they're already needy, and then you are just hoping that they will not in any way be exposed to the COVID-19 uh, virus and, and uh, be endangered by it. Um, I, I think it's important in a way, uh, one of the things that Courage for Caregivers did as a book was speak to those home caregivers, speak to those people who in a sense are the, in the trenches and on the front lines of care that has consumed their lives. They're not necessarily professionals in this situation. They're just the person whose who's child or parent or spouse needs them full time and they are now the person responsible. You have a lot of experience with that. You had a, a depth of experience with it. Tell us a little bit about the circumstances in your own life that brought you this hard-earned wisdom. <laughs> hmm. Yeah. Um, so I, I ended up um, being deeply involved in the care of both my own mother and um, John's mother um, in in our own home. Uh, the unexpected part was my mother coming to live with us, um, which we had not anticipated because she was still married to my stepdad, and we were trying to keep them together. But we had just gotten them moved into an assisted care uh, place, and uh, my mother ended up being hospitalized twice within the first few months. Um, it was very clear to us early on that she no longer had the physical energy or wellness to care for my stepdad. My my mother had a COPD condition, um, which in, toward the end is very similar to, um, um, gosh, I can't think of the, um, it, it, the condition is called bronchiectasis, and the, the lungs basically just deteriorate. Um, so she had that and also had had a heart attack just the, the year before we got her moved. Um, so she was physically just very, um, very frail. And my stepdad was kind of in the middle of a, a slow decline with dementia. So she was having to communicate for him and with him, and it was just taking hours and hours of her time and energy, and she just didn't have it. She was exhausted. Um, so she asked to come live with us. We were building a new home where we knew we'd be taking in John's mother. We were basically building the house in order to create a, a living space for John's mother and uh, because we couldn't find a house on the market that was adequate for that. Um, and we ended up having both of our mothers. <laughs> it was, uh, and and my, yeah, my mother um, was, was so f physically fragile that as soon as she came to live with us, she needed a lot of time and attention and care right away. Uh, thankfully, in those two years that she lived with us, uh, John's mother was still um, quite well and fit and, you know, getting out for walks and, and pretty independent in her little apartment connected to our house. 
Um, so that was an enormous help. Um, but yeah, talk about um, situations that just change really rapidly that you can't anticipate. Certainly having my mother come live with us as well as John's mother, that all happened within one month, you know, our move and mother's move in with us. And then John's mother, it was, it was a lot to, to handle at once. I had but, the privilege of, of visiting your home, which was a beautiful log home in the midst of quite far outside of Nashville. And I, I just, you know, think you probably couldn't get caregivers in to help. I'm sure you were quite isolated. I bet a lot fell onto your shoulders and onto John's. Well, it, it did. Um, for a while, uh, it was really difficult to find anybody. And I realized, because John and I were both working full-time and commuting in and out from from the community where we lived, which was half an hour, well, it was 30 miles west of Nashville, um, I did eventually find two people who were able to come in and help mother during daytime hours while I was at work. Um, but it was, it was not ideal. Um, it took a long time to find people that I could trust to do that. Um, one of them lived fairly close. The other one was having to, you know, drive a bit of a distance. Um, and and then even you know we I think at first it was just three or four hours a day of help, and then it turned into more than that so that she could get support really during all the hours I was at work. But as soon as I got home, her care became my responsibility, and then you know weekends as well. So it was there was just a lot a lot to handle. I would say. Um, you know, with my mother, my mother, it was more, um, the stress level was more the physical um, care and and the emotion mm-hmm. that she was my own mother. Um, but with Bab, with John's mother, whose nickname was Bab, um, she lived with us a total of 11 years, and she was just about 100 years old when she died. So this was, you know, like the last decade of her life, all through her 90s. And her situation was much more up and down. Uh, She did break her hip, um, recovered reasonably well, but spent a lot of time in a wheelchair and on a walker. And uh, toward, in the last um, couple of years of her life, her memory was, I used to say, sort of like Swiss cheese, you oh. know, full of holes. Oh. <laughs> and um, and uh, some of those personality changes that you sometimes see with, with um, real memory loss, uh, mm. we didn't get too much of that, thankfully. Um, we were spared some of the, the hardest manifestations of that. Mm. But... But with with Bab, um, she was a more difficult person to, for me at least, to um, to care for emotionally. She was just kind of a she was a person uh, full of of deep anxieties. She kept emotional distance from us. Um, suffered what I I would call a fear of intimacy, Um, had learning disabilities, you know, some ADD, was was physically deaf, and I would say emotionally deaf as well. You know, a lot of unconsciousness there. Uh, So the the challenges with her were were more profound. in terms of long-term caregiving over the course of 11 years. What were the most important spiritual lessons you learned over those years? I mean, you 10 years is a long time. I'm sure a lot of people go, well, I can maybe handle this for six months, maybe a year. But 10 years uh, when it's not all easy or comfortable. What, what were some of the yeah. spiritual lessons for you in this? Yeah. Well, there were plenty. Um, and I think particularly because... It, she, it was more demanding uh, and more of a struggle. I actually grew more spiritually with her. Um, she taught me a lot about myself, uh, about 
my own judgments, uh, my impatience, <laughs> my assumptions <laughs> and reactions, and um, my fears. You know, I, I think uh, she um, she taught me the truth. Uh, this is a truth I, I sort of learned in my head from my friend Parker Palmer, who said, you know, sometimes we live our way into new ways of thinking instead of thinking our way into new ways of living. And I actually learned that with Bab. Um, at some point, um, you know, maybe after eight, <laughs> seven or eight years of being with Bab, I, I realized that her emotional distance was really um, a signal of, of her her fear, her emotional fears that grew out of uh, childhood of being deprived of real emotional intimacy with her own parents. And some of that just had to do with the era in which she grew up. But um, I realized that she needed signs of physical love. And these were the very things that she tended to resist. Um, by that I mean, you know, in the early years when I was just getting acquainted with Bab, she would come to visit us for, you know, four or five weeks out of a year because she lived in Cyprus. I mean, the island of Cyprus in the Mediterranean. <laughs> she lived there uh, until she was 89 years old, and um, and then she came to live with us. So uh, she would, when she came to visit, it would be about a month or a little more than a month, and I just remember so clearly. She'd come to the door, and I would go greet her And uh, when she first arrived, and she, and she would blow her kiss to me. Or when she said goodnight to the two of us uh, in the evening, she would blow her kiss from across the room. <laughs> if I gave her a hug, she would just stiffen up. You know, I, She was so uncomfortable with signs of physical affection. But I realized that she was probably starved for exactly that. So I just did something very simple. I, it was kind of an experiment on my part. As I would go in and um, say goodnight to her and make sure she had everything she needed. This was before she became really dependent on me to help her undress and bathe and all of that. So she would be sitting in front of the television watching TV, but I would come in and uh, kind of make sure she had what she needed and um, we might chat a little bit about the day. So when I said goodnight to her, I would just bend over and give her a kiss on the cheek. Well, she was a little startled by that at first. Uh-huh. <laughs> you were entering new territory for her, that's for sure. <laughs> I, I, I was kind of right there in her space um, doing something she didn't expect and uh, hadn't asked for. But she didn't resist it. And I just sort of kept on doing it. And I would say, you know, I love you, Bab, when I gave her a kiss. And she would say, love you too, or something like that. You know, it always just seemed like pro forma (laughs) to me, those words. But um, what was really interesting to me was that after about two weeks of this, I remember there was one night where we were chatting away, and I I sort of forgot I was um, about to turn around and go, and she looked up at me, and she, and she takes her finger and taps her cheek right where I kissed it, as if mm. to say, "You're forgetting something oh. here." <laughs> so she was opening up to you, and you were opening up to her. That's beautiful. That's cool. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was, um, you know, and so I, and really, what I—that was just the beginning of a whole process of my learning that it was through my physical care for her, whether it was bathing her, dressing her, putting cream on her hands and legs after a bath, um, just, you know, a lot of the intimate care that, that happens there, that, that the physical care was the way I grew to love her, actually love her, yeah. to do that with gentleness, with good humor, um, See, one of my one of my spiritual lessons was, um, you know, about halfway through these eleven years, it suddenly occurred to me that my care for Bab was my primary spiritual practice. 
it wasn't an interruption of my spiritual practice. It was my primary spiritual practice. That was a, that was a big reframing of my way of seeing her care. Um, That's amazing. Yeah. So I had done a lot. You know, I teach yeah. spiritual practice. So, I, for, and I had set apart practices like praying with scripture and journaling and but this was the rubber hits the road of daily life practice you know this is what set aside practices are all about you pray with scripture or you journal or you do those time focused things in order to be able to bring god's love into your daily life with the people that you're called to be with and to serve and to love and and so i i realize it was the quality of my presence the orientation of my heart in my ability to listen to her, to accept her, to love her as she was, that was my spiritual practice. That's profound. That is just profound. It's, it's interesting because um, I, I want to tell audiences as they're listening, we have some really good books. I mean, Marjorie has written uh, Courage for Caregivers, and it is packed with stories of, of caregivers in, in the deep trenches of that task. And it's full of wisdom and it's full of spiritual insights. And I, I would encourage people to go to our website and, and get that book. There's also a workbook in case you want to do it as some sort of a study with perhaps in your church or in a small book group or whatever. There's, there are the tools for that. We also have something called Hope for Caregivers, which is a 40-day devotional, really especially for people who on a daily basis are involved in caregiving. There's there's so many of you that would be listening and you know what this is about and you can often feel isolated and uh, locked away in fact we discovered we wanted to do retreats for caregivers and we quickly discovered this was really difficult because for most caregivers it's hard to get away it's hard to get away from the person that you're taking care of and and replace yourself in that role and so getting away for a retreat although you'd love it isn't necessarily something that you have the opportunity to do as a result we're now gathering a number of materials and we're looking forward to creating a web portal which will offer wonderful stories and videos and teaching points and all sorts of resources for caregivers we really want to offer what henry has to offer and marjorie is very central to this marjorie is part of our team because she is on the henry nowen uh, board but she is also very much at the core of our caregiving initiative and of helping us shape this because we really want to take what we're learning and and apply it or bring it out. Marjorie, I can't help but wondering, what do you think Henry would have to say to caregivers in this time of COVID-19? <laughs> well, I suspect he'd have a lot <laughs> to share. <laughs> um, I, I, I actually would like to come back to another um, key piece, uh, something that I think is really distinctive to Henry's perspective about caring and that is the mutuality of caregiving i think oh, yes. this is probably something henry would really want to say to caregivers in this time because um because of the isolation because of this enforced isolation if you know if you are at home caring for a spouse or a child with high needs um or or an you know one of your elders um it can it can be hard sometimes to see the gifts. This is one thing we did discover when we were doing retreats, uh, caregiving retreats based on the book, um, which is that a lot of caregivers were sort of surprised to even think about the gift side of caregiving, what we receive from our care receivers. And uh, th this has to do with what Henry calls the mutuality uh, of caregiving. One of my favorite Henry quotes is is this one. He says, in the very act of caring for another, you and I possess a great treasure. Caregiving carries with it an opportunity for inner healing, liberation, and transformation for the one being cared for and for the one who cares. It, mm -hmm. it goes both ways. And um, I think this is this is something to pay attention to in a time when we may be in this enforced isolation and kind of thrust into the caregiving if you're doing this at home. Um, 
in an even more intense way without uh, help from others coming in from outside, perhaps, that uh, to pay attention to where the mutuality is, what gifts you are receiving even as you're giving, because that helps to nourish your own heart if you can recognize it. Give, you know, me, Henry, a, give me an example of what you mean with that, because that's really rich. Yeah, well, I think, you know, for Henry himself, he, he learned it through his care relationship with Adam, who was the most severely disabled uh, person at the Large Daybreak community when Henry got there. I, you know, Adam could not walk or talk or dress or feed himself. Um, and I think what Henry caught in that relationship with Adam is the reality that every human relationship goes deep into the mysteries of the spirit. Um, the mutuality can be quite subtle, but it's no less real. So Henry experienced Adam as a listening presence to him. Adam could listen and be present to Henry, and Henry experienced that as a profound ministry. So, um, you know, I, I certainly... Um, experienced mutuality with, with both my mother. It was maybe a little easier to see with my mom, but um, I experienced it with Bab too. And I, I think um, sometimes I needed, you know, Bab, when, when you receive care um, and you're feeling weak and, and powerless and you can't do the things that you used to be able to do, um, you you start to feel useless and just like a burden and only like a burden. And so, you know, one of the things I used to have to remind Bab is how many ways she had already contributed to our family life in so many ways. She used to cook meals for us when she was um, healthy and she enjoyed cooking. And that was a real help to us <laughs> when we were both working full time and coming home tired. And, you know, she could, she would have a meal all prepared for us. That was huge help. Sometimes it was just a matter of reminding her she had done that and that those gifts to our family life were still valid. You know, we still valued and treasured all the things that she had given to us. Um, and then, you know, I, I could just talk with her about the day and the struggles of the day or or maybe what we had accomplished together, something like, you know, getting her checkbook sorted out, uh, something that simple, and just celebrate it. Mm -hmm. and, and, uh, um, or kind of have a good laugh uh, in the bathroom. I remember... Um, one thing that particularly tickled Bab, I would take her pajamas in the wintertime and, and turn her pajama bottoms upside down over the air vents, which were in the floor, to warm them up before I put them on her. <laughs> and, of course, she was a big woman, so these these pajama bottoms would just balloon out with the air. <laughs> and she would just get laughing. We would both just get hysterical with giggles <laughs> about this. <laughs> And, you know, it's such a gift to share humor, um, particularly when things are difficult and painful. Um, and, and those are some of the, the mutual gifts that we experience and can experience. Just to be aware of where those little simple gifts of the day are, to be able to name them and celebrate them is so important. Now, you must have had times of utter exhaustion. You must have had times of going... This is more than I can handle. How, how did you get through those times, Marjorie? Mm. <laughs> oh, not always with a great deal of grace. Um, I do remember, you know, the last six months of my mother's life just feeling like I was hanging on by my fingernails, literally. I just oh. didn't know how I was going to get from one day to the next. Um, it could actually be a help to me to go to work and just have my mind on other things before I came home and had to immerse myself again, you know, in, in all the, the small daily tasks of, of caregiving for someone who was getting physically weaker and weaker. Um, I, I relied on 
uh, I, I relied on John a lot. You know, mm-hmm. I I needed um, his wisdom and and strength. And sometimes, you know, all I could do was just sort of collapse into his arms and just let him hold me, mm. um, which he was always prepared to do. Yeah. So, but we don't all have that the gift of someone like that at home. Um, it is not easy. I really think it's just so important for us to have someone, someone outside the home if possible, uh, maybe an extended family member or a friend, a friend or two that we can call on and mm-hmm. just talk to and kind of, you know, release the pressure valve. Yeah. We need to be able to talk about the experience. And one of the practices I found really helpful was to write a psalm of lament, just write my own psalm of lament. The psalms give us permission to express all of our feelings, the positive and the negative. And sometimes we just need to get it get it out of us that way. Mm-hmm. Cry out and and remember that God is the one who's compassionate with us, who mm-hmm. suffers with us. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Oh, Marjorie, I, I, I find myself thinking about the people who are facing... Oh home care caregiving now and the added issues of you may be taking care of your children at the same time or just experiencing all the limitations of the pandemic um what do you think henry has to say right now into this crisis before us and around us (laughs) yeah you know i i really think henry was always so attuned to the most vulnerable people in our world, uh, and part of that was because of his own vulnerability. He he understood vulnerability from within himself, and I I think um, I think he would really pick up on the notion of. I think this is so interesting. We, we're now using the language of essential workers mm-hmm. in our economy. Mm-hmm. And maybe, you know, we've noticed that most of these workers are not the ones our society generally considers so central. You know, trash collectors, bus drivers, farm laborers, mm-hmm. child care workers. Yeah. Um, you know, these these are or, or home caregivers who come in, pe- people who get, you know, paid home caregivers who come and help. These are people we don't pay much attention to, and we certainly don't compensate very well for their services. But in this pandemic, they turn out to be essential to the functioning of our social order. And I think Henry would want to really draw that out and say, this is revealing something important about how we see ourselves in our society and maybe you know help us see ways in which we could make changes in how we perceive and treat those who are often marginalized and i think an awful lot of folks who are at home caregiving feel pretty marginalized and pretty invisible um, as well as exhausted and henry always wanted to see and hear the stories of the vulnerable ones among us um, who were so often the focus of Jesus ministry. So, you know, I think he would want to say caregivers are now being seen as essential workers, (laughs) you know? Yes. Um, And there's a lot of people who felt sidelined in that role. Yeah. 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 So, you know, I, I and I find myself wondering, you know, if the if the value, if we're just, you know, maybe our society can wake up to just how critical caregivers are, whether home caregivers or professional caregivers, um, including home aides, nurses, social workers, therapists, chaplains, you know, mm-hmm. and and parents caring for educating children at home now. Mm-hmm. I, you know, I wonder if the value of care for the most vulnerable people in our society, whether they're young or old, disabled or sick, you know, might finally come more to the center of how we value and compensate people. Um, 
I don't know, but I, I think Henry would really want to lift that up. And then I think, you know, he would also want to talk about um, particularly, uh, well, I, you know, I, I think he would want to say to all you caregivers out there, you are deeply important to all of us. Amen. And the pandemic is just revealing how essential your labor of care really is physically, emotionally, and spiritually. You know, as as human societies, we need your compassion, your heart for others, your willingness to give yourself, your witness to what is most deeply human in us, which I think Henry would say is also what is most divine in us. Mm. What is most deeply human is most deeply divine. And that's that's what Jesus combines it's what he shows us what's most deeply human in us and that 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 is divine love that can be embodied in our own lives so you know and and i think henry would also want to say and i you know i want to really reinforce this this whole situation with the pandemic is probably the greatest crisis we've faced in several generations if if not you know a hundred years Mm-hmm. It's adding stress to the already stressful caregiving that folks are engaged in. So the abnormality of life is straining our mental health. And so self-care is more important now than ever, especially with the enforced social isolation that so many of us are experiencing. So, you know, it may be the person you care for is the only other person you see face to face now. That's certainly a possibility. Um, And again, to be sustained, you need others in your support community. So, so I think Henry would be um, (laughs) saying, take advantage of your telephone, (laughs) your computer, if you have one uh, to reach out and talk uh, and hopefully, you know, if you have a way to do this, to connect by video uh, so you can see the faces of other family or friends or colleagues, um, really don't um, minimize your own need for support, your need for self-care in the midst of this. Um, try to maintain some form of exercise some practice of prayer or meditation to stay centered spiritually because these things also are essential. They're essential to your well-being as a caregiver so that you can continue to care for others. I think, too, in in saying that, Marjorie, um, we who may know of people who are caregiving right now on that in, especially those kind of locked away in home caregiving situations. It's also our responsibility to reach out and say, you're not forgotten and how can I be there for you? Let's just talk, get a cup of tea and let's talk on the phone. Or as you said, you know, on your computer, thank goodness for Zoom and all the different possible ways we can get to see people. It does mean a lot to see faces. It does mean a lot to to have that little visit and not feel forgotten. So I would really encourage those as you're as you're listening to this and you're thinking about that reality and maybe this isn't the circumstances of your life now, but maybe there's somebody in your circle that you can remember right now that would probably really love to have a sounding board, a place they could just take their sense of being uh, fatigued to the max or overwhelmed or whatever they're feeling uh, and you can be that place that can be a listening post for them I think that's really important I really do Marjorie you have so much to give I want to encourage people if you have felt that this somehow touches your heart and the, the needs you face or you think of others please take a look at these uh, resources we have on the Henry Noun website Uh, We have, as I said, hope for caregivers, and we have courage for caregivers, and also now healthy caregiving. It's a, we didn't see the pandemic coming, but here we are in the midst of it. 
with some really vile tools. And I remember saying to everybody, we're not the people who put the Band-Aid on. You know, I'm not out there trying to solve uh, what will be the vaccine. But we know we can offer spiritual nurturing. And I think, um, Marjorie, I think you, you, you do it with such wisdom and uh, authority. And I, I'm so grateful for that. Have you got one last word you'd like to share with those caregivers that are facing this um, in their home situations or as professionals? I'd love to actually just give the last word to Henry. Um, and he, it, it, there's another quote on mutuality that really speaks to me. It spoke to me in my condition because I was caring for elders. And he's writing this about um, the aged. But I think it applies to to every kind of caregiving situation in a sense. Um, and just speak so beautifully to, to, to the power of God's Spirit in all human relationships. I mean, relationship, just by virtue of the definition of that word, the meaning of that word, involves mutuality. And, and I think it's so helpful for us to see that mutuality and to look for it and to um, lift it up when we experience it uh, because it can help to nurture us even in our isolation. So here's, here's the quote, um, and just try to sort of um, <laughs> uh, apply it to, to uh, more than the aged. But Henry says, our weakness and old age call people to surround us and support us. Um, any situation where we ourselves are vulnerable and need help, and I would say as caregivers right now, we have our own vulnerabilities and need help. I mean, even you know, our, our medical professionals, doctors and nurses, we're beginning to see how vulnerable they are in the midst of a time like this where they're so overwhelmed. Um, so think of it in those terms. However, vul however we experience our vulnerability and need, that calls people to surround and support us. By so now Henry's words again. By not resisting our weakness, by gratefully receiving another's care, we call forth community and provide our caregivers, or let's say our those who support us an opportunity to give their own gifts of compassion, care, love, and service. As we are given into their hands, others are blessed and enriched by caring for us. So our weakness bears fruit in their lives. I, this is just, mm -hmm. this is coming back to Henry's distinctive voice. His, you know, this is just an extraordinary perspective that, shows so clearly the spiritual opportunity given to us um, by those we serve with our care and the ways we, when we are feeling vulnerable and in need of the care and support of others, we're giving them a chance to, to enliven and deepen their own compassion and love and service. This is the mutuality of human relationships so um, I, just, I just find that perspective so profound and helpful in a time like this and hope that, that those of us who are feeling our own exhaustion and vulnerability um, will acknowledge that we need others to reach out and kind of support and help care for us while we are caregiving for others. It's all part of this beautiful mutual circle, the circles and circles and spirals of, of human relationship that Henry could see so clearly. And um, it's just at the heart of how the spirit works in our lives. Lovely. Thank you so much, Marjorie. It's been a pleasure talking with you, Karen, really. Marjorie, thank you so much for this. I really appreciate having the opportunity to talk with you today. You are a fountain of knowledge about this. You learn the hard things by being um, 
challenged by it in your own life, home caregiving became a reality for you for 10 years. And out of it came some treasures, some understanding, and certainly a beautiful book. Thank you for that. Thank you so much, Karen. (laughs) You take care now. Take care. Bye-bye. If you enjoyed today's podcast, we'd be so grateful if you'd take time to give it a stellar review or a thumbs up and share it with your friends and family. As well, you'll find links in the show notes for our website and any content, resources, or books discussed in this episode. There's even a link to books to get you started in case you're new to the writings of Henry Nouwen. Thanks for listening. Until next time.